I had heard of people doing long-term travel. I think while I was younger, there was also an element of fear. It was a lot more influence from well-meaning family members and friends that that's not safe for a woman to travel alone. You know, what's going to happen to you? Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living podcast, where we are reimagining and redefining what it means to be in midlife where we are gathering energy, momentum, and excitement for our next chapter via candid conversations with other midlifers about their own pivots, pitfalls, and triumphs. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. Do you have the itch to travel? And do you ever wonder what it would be like to do it as a part of your day-to-day life? Today, we all get to live vicariously through my guest, Stephanie Mojica. Stephanie wanted to travel for the longest time. She had a career as an award-winning reporter, but after some time in that career, she realized she wanted more control over her life and her schedule. She started several side hustles to explore what else she might do, eventually establishing an online business coaching people to write their own books as thought leaders. Once she had a solid online business, she started getting curious about being a digital nomad. Some major life events inspired her to finally take the leap. She started with Canada and has spent the past year in South America. We talk about how she gathered the courage to pursue her dream and how it's working out so far. I can't wait for you to meet her. But before we do, I'm wondering how you're doing. I'm wondering if you have a project on the back burner or are itching for more travel in your life, or maybe you keep thinking about, I don't know, writing a book or finally getting in shape, or you wish you could learn to sing and you can't seem to make yourself take the steps to make it happen. So I created a free guide for you designed to help you start taking the steps towards your next act. It's a workbook. It's called Five Steps to Your Midlife Reboot. You can sign up to receive it as an email series with practical exercises you can use over the course of several weeks to get past feeling stuck. You can do these at your own pace as they'll just be waiting for you in your inbox when you're ready for the next step. I'll remind you at the end of the episode and tell you where to sign up if you're interested. Okie dokie. Without further ado, here's Stephanie Mojica. Let's go. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for having me, Yvonne. I really appreciate it. Oh my gosh, it's just great. It feels like it's been a long time coming since the last time we talked. It Um, has been. (laughs) Yeah, I always like to say how I met people. So you and I met in Clubhouse. um, And I remember... I remember hearing you speak and just instantly, that's why we were just talking before we started the hitting, hit the record button about Clubhouse. It was like the minute I heard your voice, I felt a connection to you, which is why I love Clubhouse. It's crazy. But, um, and that, and, and got a little snippet of your story and it was just enough for me to think, huh, I think maybe we need to talk. So um, I would love to hear, I mean, you're, you're living in Suriname now, right? As a digital nomad? Yes, I'm in Suriname. It's a very small country in South America. It's near Guyana, which everybody knows for the Jonestown tragedy. French Mm -hmm. Guyana, which a lot of people don't know is a very small country that's actually still legally a part of France. And then it's also near Brazil, one of the many Brazilian borders. So it's in Northeast South America, but it's wow. not its not on the ocean. It's not an island. Gotcha. Wait, so how did you pick Suriname? I mean, I, so I kind I know we're, we're going to go backwards in a minute, but I'm curious about how you picked where you are now. I know it's, you've been kind of moving from place to place, right? Yes. Well, so I took a, a graduate school class through the Harvard Extension School, I think, Gosh, it would be almost four years ago now, and it was on the Caribbean. So Suriname is not an island. There's no beaches, et cetera, but it's a CARICOM country, which is like a community of Caribbean countries. So they like are part of this, I guess it's a coalition, you call it. So it was included in the class, and I just thought it was interesting the way this professor was talking about it. He said... You know, he highly recommended going to Suriname, Guyana, and French Guiana. A lot of Americans don't ever make it there. 
He did say for Guyana, you need a guide because there's a lot of more potential danger. But I just, that's kind of a short version of why I decided to come here. And then there's a long story about why I wound up staying more than just a few weeks. (laughs) Oh, okay. Well, you can either launch right into that if you want or back up a little bit to what had you start traveling. So you're in your 40s now, right? Yes, um, almost 42. So I'll, I guess I'll go back to what made me decide to start traveling. So my dog died in September 2018. And I was living in Lexington, Kentucky at the time. And things were okay, but they weren't great. I was basically at the tail end of a romantic relationship that it wasn't a bad relationship, but we just had different priorities. It was also 17 year age difference with him being on the older end and caretaking for multiple family members. I am a recovering codependent, which means I have pretty good boundaries and he was not having good boundaries with his family members. So I knew that this was not going to work out. My dog passed away and I'd always wanted to travel, but I couldn't. For a lot of reasons, I worked as a newspaper reporter for 17 years. So I loved my job. I got a lot of awards, but money was always a big, fat issue. Even though I had all these side hustles when I had time, like coaching, editing, etc., the money was always an issue. And then getting time off was an even bigger issue. It's like I had vacation time, but getting it was like pulling teeth. So I never really got to go anywhere except another state. I think once I got to go to Canada for a week, but to me, that just didn't feel like traveling. Cause like I was saying before, you know, when I was younger, we could drive in and out of Canada. So I just decided, and I'll just be honest, since this isn't a business business podcast, I was not happy with the way things are going to the United States uh, with Donald Trump being Latina, you know, my father is, you know, the son of Mexican immigrants. There was some racism, some hate going on where I was living. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, my intuition was spot on. A lot of terrible things have happened in Kentucky since I left. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start traveling. So I said I was going to go to Canada again because I wanted to like explore Toronto I went, so I went to Boston to see some friends and I went to Toronto, spent two weeks there. And then I went from Toronto to Trinidad because Trinidad was a island, is an island that my professor that I just mentioned from Harvard was really talking about. He's talking about the great food, literature, et cetera, plus English is the official language. So I figured my first foreign country (laughs) in English would probably be a good thing to do. So did that. Stayed in Trinidad for three months, came to Suriname, because actually I was supposed to go to Brazil. Because So I just want to back up. I speak really, pretty much close to fluent Portuguese, and I speak a lot of other languages. But my dream for many, 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 many years, at least 15, was to go to Brazil, maybe buy a house in Brazil just everything about the culture, the people, the various religions, the food, the the beauty, the history just really excited me. And had you been to Brazil before? No, but I knew a whole lot about it just from, I, I study foreign languages online. So like just encountering Brazilian people when I taught English, I read lots of books. Again, this came back to school just videos, just something about it really attracted me. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start on on the way to Brazil. Actually, I was supposed to teach English as a second language in Brazil. So I'm in Suriname. This is July, August, yeah, July 2019. And the Amazon forest fires started Mm. in Brazil while I was in Suriname. Mm. And yeah. some, but something bigger than the forest fires is telling me, do not go to Brazil. And nobody, I didn't understand it, and nobody around me understood it because it was all I talked about for years. People were, frankly, quite sick of it. They were like, you've never been there. What's the big deal? You're Mexican and Irish and, you know, Native American and Jewish. Like, there's no guy there. What the, you know what? <laughs> but it was one of those things I never could explain. 
And something told me, do not go, do not go. And I'm thinking, hey, this is ridiculous, but okay. I'm not particularly religious. I believe in a lot of different things, but I decided to stay. And I have a few friends here, et cetera. So January 2020, my friend and I, a Suriname's friend that I met here, a young woman, and I went to French Guiana for a week. And we were going to go to Brazil with her step. Uh, mother and father, but they had just changed the immigration rules to where she, as a Surinamese citizen, was not going to be able to get into Brazil with us. So we didn't go. Oh my goodness. We didn't, we didn't know this. And then we all know what happened. In Mar- so we said, okay, we'll go in April 2020. We set the weekend. Well, we all know what happened on March in March 2020. Mm-hmm. March 13, 2020 was when the first, I remember that day always, was when the first person in Suriname died of what they had thought was a virus only coming from China, because that was the information they had. So Suriname had stopped all the Chinese flights from coming in, but they didn't know because the virus is so young. So March 13th, 2020, the first person in Suriname died of the coronavirus. Suriname had tried its very best to protect us from the virus, it was very young. We didn't know anything about it. So they had shut off airplanes coming in from China because, you know, it originally started in Wuhan. Right. But they, they didn't know that it was all over the world. So people from other countries were coming in. And so people started getting it. And my, we, so we didn't get to go. We didn't get to go to French Guiana or Brazil. And I haven't left the country since. Wow. So you've, but you, did you guys ever go into a full on lockdown? Yes, we had two weeks of total lockdown. I don't, it was either late March or April where we could only go out once a week, depending on the first letter of our last name. Thank God, my friend and I, we both have the same first letter. Oh, good. Yeah. Wow. And now we're on weekend lockdowns. You can hear the rain probably. Yeah, so, I'm. Th- so that's the sound we're hearing is because it wasn't there in the beginning, and there it is. So it's rain. Do you get a lot of rain in Suriname? I imagine you must. We do. We have rain seasons and dry seasons. My friend and I were just talking about this earlier. We have not had a dry season in months. You know, I really am not trying to get crazy political, but climate change seems to be very much a reality in the mm-hmm. like almost two years. I've mostly been in Suriname. The rain is getting heavier. We actually had historic floods this week where literally the border between Suriname and French Guiana is flooded out. Not that people are supposed to be crossing the border right now anyway. And a lot of villages are underwater. Even in, I live in the capital city, Paramaribo, and we were out earlier today and a lot of the streets are still underwater. There were a few days where we couldn't go out earlier this week because the car is low. (laughs) So it's too risky to. Right. Yeah. So, it, but th- there were still folks, they deliver food on mopeds here, most of them. There were still folks out there working hard in their mopeds, just trying to do their very best to make the money and get food to the people. Right. Oh my gosh. That's so crazy. It's, it's. Ah, that whole thing with climate change, scary business. You've been there. So you were there two years before going into lockdown or about a year before going into lockdown? Okay, so I was here July 2019 to October 2019. Went away. I went back to Trinidad for a week, basically to get stamped. You know, we call it a Mm -hmm. visa run. Get your, Mm -hmm. you know, get your stamps, you know, go in and out. So July well, 2019 to October 2019, then came back October 2019 to January 2019. I haven't left the country since like the first week of January of 2020. So I haven't left the country in, I guess, at the time of this recording, almost 16 months. Wow. Well, lucky, I mean, I'm just thinking about how great it is that you were there bef- for some time, enough time to make friends before yeah. this happened, right? Because otherwise, right. I imagine it would have the isolation might have been uh, pretty intense. I might have gone back to the United States. There were options to go back to the United States, especially the beginning of it. 
Yeah. But the virus was so new. I talked to my ex-partner. Like I said, we're still very close friends. And my mother and everybody has seemed and think it would be a bad idea to go get on a plane because nobody knew yeah. how you could get the virus. And because I called my ex-partner, I'm like, you know, you said if I need a ticket home, you would get me one. I really need a ticket home. And he's like, I'm going to tell you why. I don't think it's a good idea. And then I called my mom and she was like, I agree. And Yeah. Yeah, no way I would have gotten on a plane back then either. Um, amazing, amazing. So th- so this whole dream of like travel uh and here you are. It, it took until it took until your 40s. I mean, you're you're on the younger end of the people I usually talk to because right. I'm I'm 52. Usually kind of end up talking to people like circling their 50s, I like to think and you know, even on up. Um so what is it that stopped you from doing the travel earlier? I mean, I know you had your job. It was tough to get, it was tough to get the, the time off. And were there, was there anything else that was involved with keeping you from, from doing, I mean, when did you get the idea to become like a digital nomad to, to have a business I mean, it just kind of happened. So I had quit my last newspaper job. I was teaching English online, doing writing, editing, and coaching. And I just, one day after my dog died, and it just kind of popped in my head that I started looking at Airbnb. It's like, okay, I'm paying rent to live here and just sit in this house. Like I could go pay rent somewhere else. So it just kind of happened that way. I don't think there was, I had heard of people doing long-term travel. I think while I was younger, there was also an element of fear. It was a lot more influence from well-meaning family members and friends that that's not safe for a woman to travel alone, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. You know, what's going to happen to you. And I'll be honest, there have been a couple of the little alarming incidents, but I've actually felt safer outside the U.S. and Canada than I felt in many places in the U.S. especially. Interesting. I'm talking everywhere from Virginia to Los Angeles to Boston to Kentucky. Tech. I mean, I've been, I think, the 40 of the 50 states. I'd have to go count. As a woman of color, especially in the last, like, few years, I just, I, I had incidents with the police, had people, like, treating me differently. Mm. I just never felt all that safe. I'm so sorry. And that just heightened, just kept heightening. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's gotten crazy lately for sure. Oh my gosh. I mean, maybe it's always been crazy and now we're, I mean, I kind of feel like in, in a way, and maybe you let me know your, your take on this, that the political climate you know, from 2016 on, I kind of feel like it just made what was already there more visible. Mm-hmm. And then, and then, uh, you know, COVID too took it to the, to the very next level of, mm-hmm. of kind of putting it in our face more that, that this yeah. is a problem that's been here, this inequality um, that, as a, you know, as a white woman, I, you know, I probably went with that whole idea of like colorblind, you know, right. and, you know, it, it's just, sh- it's been shocking and, mm-hmm. and sad to see where we really are, where's people, where people's opinions really lie. Mm-hmm. And maybe mm-hmm. that's always been that undercurrent that's been there that um, we just, you know, well-intentioned white people perhaps weren't aware uh, enough. It's complicated because my mother's white. So in some situations I have passed as white and actually I'm seen as a white person outside of the United States, which is very strange. So they just see my skin and know I'm from America and they're like, oh, They'll call me the blonde dom, which means white lady in Dutch. But, you know, even when I was a little kid, people would say stuff about my last name. People would make fun of it. In the late 1990s, there was police harassment. I was pulled over driving a car that was pretty much new. It was from my grandfather's dealership. 
and the police were saying, this is too much car for somebody like you. What are, what are you really up to? Wow. And then after September 11th, 2001, there was an increased harassment because somebody just sees brown skin and they just thought Muslim. There was increased airport like security. I'm always pulled out of lines. Always, always, always. Um, <laughs> except in Texas. But uh, I haven't been to a Texas airport in many, many years. So it's probably different today. So I think like the political situation definitely contributes. And then when this stuff started coming out in 2015, 2016, you know, you have the somebody who's running for the president of the United States screaming about a wall 24-7. And I, don't get me wrong, I understand why some people voted for him. Some people I care about very much vote for him for, I truly believe, other reasons. Mm-hmm. But when you have somebody standing up on a world stage screaming these things and just saying they all commit this, 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 and this, it right. just makes it safe for people because I grew up in the South, I've lived in the South, it's always existed, but it just makes it makes people feel safer saying what they really feel. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping that, you know, what comes out of this is that now that it's, you know, that it's more in the open, that maybe we can actually address it in a more honest way and deal with it in a way we've never dealt with it before. That's my, that's my hope and prayer. Sorry. I thought you're done. I'm not sure because, you know, my friends, I have friends who are from Holland and friends are from here that live here have been asking me, there's been, you know, we know all about the black lives matter. I mean, again, this stuff, black and Brown people being killed by police has been going on for decades. Uh, But now Asian Americans are being beaten, harassed over the virus. It doesn't feel like anyone this is my experience, please No, I haven't been inside of the United States for over two years, but in, in my, in, in, in my perception, I, I think it, it's really not safe right now if you're a person of color. Right. Yeah, no, certainly not. Certainly not. I just hope we're, you know, that putting it, putting it out in the open, I'm hoping, I'm hoping we'll reach that tipping point of I turning it so. around, you know? I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. Oh my goodness. Um, so how do you feel about having made this massive change in your life? Like what, what, what do you, is there something you wish you had known before you, before you decided to take the leap and do it? I wish I had known the virus was coming. <laughs> But everybody I've talked to has said there's no way to possibly predict that. Right. Because, I mean, technically, it's fine to be in stuck here. And, like, if I really, really want to leave, I could go take a plane to Holland and then go take a plane back to the United States. But I think I've covered there's a multitude of reasons why I'm not dying to go back to the United States. I, so I don't think there's anything, you know, let's just put, act like the virus doesn't exist. I don't think there's anything I would have done differently. Also, living in countries with lower cost of living makes me more willing to take chances with my business, not focus so much on making money the second. Like, I occasionally did a podcast interview with the United States, but the cost of living was so expensive. I really had to focus on getting that money in. If I had to go teach English online early in the morning, late at night, that's how I funded my plane tickets and, you know, first Airbnbs. It's just... That's what I had to do. And so I I just find that I don't think there's anything I would have done differently. I and I don't even want to say I would have done it sooner. So I don't think there's anything I would have done differently. Yeah. What have you learned about yourself in the past couple of years? Uh I've learned that I don't need a relationship <laughs> to survive. Although I will say there is a flirtation with somebody here. I don't know if that's going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I don't really, you know, want to get into that, but that I think about this a minute. I think that when I was in the United States, I was eating a lot more junk food 
the sodas, the soft drinks, whatever, pop, whatever you want to call it. I know in different parts of the country, I call it different things. Have a lot of garbage in them. And every other country doesn't put that in their drinks. Mm. And so it's like, I can have one Coca-Cola in the morning. That's it. I'm not sitting there wanting five more throughout the day. Because they're making them with sugar, not corn soda. And I always thought, oh, they're just running their mouths about corn syrup. It's not that big of a deal, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it kind of (laughs) is. So, yeah, and we don't have, we have fast food here. Don't get me wrong. But it's not like as much a part of lifestyle. And same thing with Trinidad and French Guiana. I don't even remember seeing, we drove throughout most of the country. I think I saw maybe one McDonald's. So we don't have like, you know, McDonald's and all that stuff every corner. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not knocking it, but it's just very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so you feel like you're eating better since you've made the change? Yeah. But lately I've caught myself slipping up a little bit, like not with the fast food, but like for instance, I got two triple chocolate muffins at the grocery store. We're getting ready to go into a weekend lockdown where we'll be locked down all week and we can have food delivered. But I try not to do that during the weekend lockdown because they'll say they'll be there an hour and sometimes it's free. That's another thing. I really have had to get more flexible with time because they have a different relationship with time outside of the United States. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, we, we definitely, uh, there, there's that, that South American, you know, slower pace, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, do you like that slower pace? Has that been a nice change for you? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't because like when I'm just, I, I think that's a common misconception throughout the world that just because somebody's working at home doesn't mean they're not working. So it's like, it's sometimes hard for me to order food because for instance, I have an appointment with you. Well, if they're late, that jeopardizes. So I have to plan a little better than I would. The app doesn't tell you, it doesn't track them the way Uber eats and other things do. So you can't really tell it gives an estimated time. Yeah. And some, sometimes they're early, but usually if they're late. (laughs) That's funny. So, so you, you have a, your background, your, your business background or your, your career background is that you were a reporter yes. and you've taught and you've done, you've taught English online. Um, yes. And then part of this whole digital nomad flip is that now you're consulting with business owners and coaches and you're helping them to, to publish books, Right. Right. So I did a little bit of that in Kentucky. I was like a writing, they called it mentor, mentor and teacher through a literacy center. So there were people that would come to me. I would literally help them write and publish their book. And then one of my clients, he got to become a big time speaker, coach, et cetera, from it. So I've always done some kind of coaching, mentoring, teaching. But yeah, especially during a pandemic, because I had a lot more time to be at home, (laughs) I started working with a coach again and things like that and just trying to do more things to change my business and my life because I would really like to be able to continue to do the digital nomad thing and also build some passive income. So I'm having a mini course called Get Your Book Out of Your Head Into Reality put online as we record this and just things like that as well as the one-on-one client work and starting a group program as well. So, yeah. It's a big shift. That's a big shift going from being a reporter and doing the coaching and kind of Mm -hmm. like the one-to-one thing Mm -hmm. and the teaching of English to more of an entrepreneurial thing. Have you, so, so that then requires you getting out right on social media, getting on clubhouse, like you and I met and, and putting yourself out there in a whole new way. Right. How is that? What's that learning curve been like for you? It's been kind of scary. I'll be honest with you. Like I do fine in situations like this. I'm not crazy about recording videos. I'm not crazy about going live. I'm not a person that likes to like pitch, 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 sell, 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 sell. Uh I kind of, 
it, that's why it's important for me to work with a coach because she, you know, and I believe if you're coaching people, you need to have a coach. Uh, it, that's just my opinion. But, you know, she like, and I set specific 90 day goals, et cetera. She has specific steps. Like she has this thing she calls a marketing dashboard. It says how many times a week you should be posting on social media, how many connection calls you should be having, you know, with people that you can, how many sales calls, et cetera. So it's just very interesting. And yes, I, I do have a virtual assistant. So there's this, because I find I, I, I still catch myself spending more time working in my business than on it. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, boy, that's a challenge, right? <laughs> so that's why I'm not starting a podcast just yet, because I can see. Because another thing, because of my writing background and the fact that I still do like a lot of editing of people's books and stuff, I need every word to get out there. I can't have a bunch of spelling errors, you know, bad grammar, et cetera. So right. there's yeah. some stuff I'm just simply not going to be able to outsource. Right, right. I, I, I found I have that to tell even you, like I'm, native, I'm, native speakers like have messed mess things up and I just. Mm, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to figure all that out right now. It's like. It's um, hard. Yeah, because one of the reasons I was able to start the podcast was that my my photography business slowed down because of COVID. Like, well, it literally came to a grinding halt in March, right? So this idea that I'd had for the podcast that I'd been putting off because I was like, I don't know if I can do both. That's a lot. And I don't know how to do it. And all the wah, wah, wah in my head. All of a sudden, boom, I'm not I'm not able to do photography. So I had this three-month swath of time to dig in and figure it out. And then things picked up last summer. That was great because I could shoot outside. And then in the fall, things slowed down again, um, well, late fall probably. And so I got the whole through the whole winter, I've been really focusing on the, you know, the podcast and doing that and getting it, you know, building an audience and doing all the stuff. And now photography has completely picked, like, now I'm like, whoosh, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. it is like full steam ahead trying to figure out both and trying to figure out, okay, can I get somebody to edit the podcast? What do I do? What do I, it's a lot, right? To try to figure this out. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are you willing to let go of? Right. What are you willing, like you said, you, you're, there's certain stuff you don't want to like let go of or don't feel you could. I need to let go of a lot of the emails, but again, I'm just going to have to make another email address where it's clear that it's not me responding because again, I'm just, my, my brand, what I do, I just can't have, I, I can't have a bunch of errors out there, but yeah. yeah, the emails take quite a bit of time. So I'm going to have to figure out a way. I guess to, it's finding somebody you trust, right? Like, yeah. I've had a hard time because, like I said, even people I went to school with, like that I know have English degrees, they make a lot of typos. And I'm not like one of these crazy micromanaging people. I would love not to, but it's just <laughs> stressful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. So, so, so you're learning how to figure out how to delegate. You're mm-hmm. learning how to put yourself out there yeah, uh, in a way that's not comfortable. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Oof, I've, I feel you sister. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. If you, if you like you, if you were to give advice to somebody who wanted to, let's say, let's say, let's say there's somebody listening who, who wants to look into being a digital nomad, like what, what kind of advice or what, what's been your experience of what, what you would say to somebody who is putting it off? Well, I would just say seriously, can, well, obviously consider your lifestyle, people who have children, pets, spouses, et cetera, probably aren't going to be able to do it unless the whole family is willing to. I have no experience with having children or anything like that. So I can't speak from that end, but I would say, you know, if everything in that direction is aligned, I would say just be certain that you have 
and you may be working a full-time job. Sometimes I do a room on Clubhouse that's uh, quit your day job to travel. <laughs> I shall be doing that tonight. I do that on a lot of Thursdays. You know, and I always tell people, and this is with the people I coach too, don't quit your day job until you have like some kind of side hustle going mm-hmm. or a lot of savings or preferably both. I think that, you know, I had enough side hustles, business stuff going. I knew I could do it. That's pretty much, except for the literacy center stuff, which was somewhat occasional. I I could, I knew I could do it, but it had taken me a few years to get to that point. And I had more options than I knew what to do with, especially when I was teaching English, just because I made sure I got approved on a bunch of sites. But I pretty much quit teaching English right around the time of the pandemic just because I was like, okay, I was making like nine, ten dollars an hour doing it, which is great for here. But I'm like, no, I see all these people I've known for years making a lot of money online and my expenses were low. I was at home a lot. So I really decided to just start working with this coach I knew and just really pushing my way forward. Yeah. Do you, and so you're doing a lot of one-on-one work with clients, editing, yes. coaching, coaching. Mm-hmm. and and then are you trying to put, it sounds like you're trying, are you trying to scale that? Are you trying to put, put together I, a model where you can do a more of a one-to-many approach of, of selling something where you don't have, it, your t- it doesn't have to be an exchange of your time? Yes. Yeah, so in, I think it was February, I had a mini workshop called Get Your Book Out of Your Head and Into Reality. So we met for 90 minutes on Zoom. I had 15 people sign up. Everybody had great value. I actually recorded it, have it broken up into modules and having somebody put it on Kajabi and then going to do the whole Facebook ads thing, et cetera to sell it as a mini course. Yeah. So, and I'm also, as of the time of this recording, starting a group program six months from book idea to final chapter. So I'm going to be focusing more on the group because you can only do so much one-to-one work. Right. It's yeah. like, especially when, I'm not really doing many writing projects right now just because it's so labor intensive, but it's like, there's always so much energy for one-to-one. So I'm really trying to leverage that into a great program. And I just have to have faith that it's going to come. Yes, you do. You got to have faith that it's going to come, boy, right? Otherwise, how do you keep going? Exactly. Yeah. Is there anything that you tell yourself on the doubtful days? I say, and this is uh, actually from somebody on YouTube called Veronica Isles. She's a big law of attraction coach. Yes, this is what the current moment is showing me, but tomorrow can bring miracles. There you go. Because, yeah, sometimes stuff does come in slowly. Like, I had to hustle to get those 15 people into that little workshop. I actually well, got congratulations. I mean, house. 15 people in a workshop is no joke. That's, yeah. That's a nice I don't, number. I don't, yeah. I have a good reputation among the people who know me, but I don't have this huge email list I've been working on building that over this last year. Yeah. That's the one thing I wish I had done differently. So if there's anybody listening that wishes they could be a digital nomad entrepreneur, please focus on building your email list because you control that Facebook, LinkedIn, all those right now, they're changing the algorithm every day. So years ago, everybody was seeing my posts about anything. Now it's like, I'm lucky if five people see it without paying for it. And then they just changed the paid ads model as of the time we're recording this. So I would just really encourage folks to, and it could just be a, a spreadsheet of people you've worked with or just, do everything you can to get those emails and then reach out to folks from time to time. It doesn't always have to be to sell them. It could be like a tip or mm-hmm. maybe you're interviewed on a podcast and send them the link. But I would definitely, if I could go back, I would do that. Focus yeah. more on building the email list, even when I was still working full time. Yeah. Do you, I, you know, this is a question I haven't really ever asked anybody, but I'm starting to think about this more and more. Where do you see, like, do you see yourself, um, do you have, do you like visualize, do you have an image of yourself like in your seventies or eighties? And do you think about what you want that to look like or? I haven't really thought about that. Um, 
I think it's because a lot of my life I was depressed a lot, uh, you know, clinical stuff. So I don't think I necessarily ever thought I would be that old. That sounds kind of depressing. But I don't, I don't have to think about that because I've never really thought about it. I definitely, I mean, I want to have a partner in the future. I want to have like a great business that can run itself more, you know, not just depend on me giving a bunch of one-on-one services Mm -hmm. and not feel like I can take time off. I definitely want to have houses in multiple countries, but I haven't thought about my seventies and eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I've kind of been uh, doing a little bit more of that lately, trying to see, well, gosh, what, what might that look like? You know? Right. I'll Um, think about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing. And, you know, sometimes too, I'll, I'll have to give myself a, I'll, I'll kind of do a little visualization of like, okay, future me, future me has done all this great stuff. And, you know, Mm -hmm. pie in the sky, big hairy goals. Right. Mm -hmm. And future me is like looking back on me now and every now and again, she just has to say, you're doing great. Just keep going. (laughs) <laughs> you're, doing, you're doing great. Just keep going. You know, um, I do that sometimes kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what, so you've got, so tell me again about the thing that you've got coming up that you're going to be offering. When, when is that going to be available for folks? Yeah, I think everything's definitely going to be up and ready by sometime in May. Awesome. So you're thinking like sometime mid-May, you're going to have that available. This will probably come out in early June. So, and so we'll let people know, we'll get that in the show notes for everybody to um, check it out. If anybody feels like you got a book in you that you want some help with, Stephanie's your girl. Um, What else is coming up? What else are you excited about that's coming up? Is there anything else that you're excited about? Well, I just recently finished a free ebook called Three Things You Must Know Before Writing Your Book. You can get that at gettheirattentionnow.com forward slash book. Gettheirattentionnow.com forward slash book. I have the group coaching program coming up six months from book idea to final chapter. We're planning on starting that June 2nd. I wish you so much luck. I hope that we are in rooms together in Clubhouse again uh, in the future. Because I I, I mean, I know I feel like I talk about Clubhouse all the time anymore, but it is just, I don't know. It's like you go in there and people, like the guardrails come down and people, Mm -hmm. there's a lot more authenticity. I mean, it's such an overused word these days, but... Um, people are, are much more open, uh, I find. Uh, I agree. I mean, I've talked I've talked to some of the biggest coaches in my industry, one, you know, while well, well, we're talking directly in a group of room of many, but it's just like some of these people make like seven, eight figures and aren't easily accessible giving advice for free. And now they're getting on the bandwagon. And then I've been having people like some really high profile people follow me and asking to do collaborations. And I think it's a way to really get to know who's fake and who's not. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It, it's, it's amazing. So I just, I anybody it. who's listening, come join us over there. I'd love to talk to you. I mean, it is just really, there's something I love doing this podcast. I love having a one-on-one conversation with you, Stephanie. I love th- this whole, this, just this one-to-one format, but man, there is a, there is something great about being able to talk directly to people in that format of, of, just, um, just cutting through a lot of the BS and, uh, and being able to, to be real together in a space. Uh, yeah. Anyway, (laughs) I hope I see you there again soon. Thank you. And I'm wishing you all the best with the new challenges you've put in front of yourself. I, I mean, my, my opinion is, is that if we have a purpose that we're, we're diving into and we're trying something new there that the energy that that gives you do you find that you've got more energy like stepping into doing this new thing 
Yes, I do. But I find I also have to start putting some better boundaries around because I can mm. find that myself working all the time. Yes. I used to be really good about not checking email at night. But see, I'm on Clubhouse at night because if I get on Clubhouse too much during the day, I'm not going to get my other work done. Mm-hmm. So I'm still trying to find some balance around that. And I'm really going to have to start taking what an old mentor of mine, Allie Brown, calls a sacred day, like a day off where you don't even think about business. Oh my gosh. I try, I'm trying to make Sundays that day um, when at all possible. And boy, when I do disconnect, I'm not checking emails. I'm not looking mm-hmm. at social. I'm not doing, and, and th- there is something, it, and it frees you. It frees you to step into it again the next day with more energy right. and, and, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So good yeah, luck would, with yeah. getting getting those boundaries put put together. I'm 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 working on that too. It's it's tricky. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome talking to you, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Well, there you have it. I don't know about you, but I've definitely thought of hitting the road while working, and I've wondered how I might do it. It's a lot to think about, especially since my kids are busy teenagers. But you know, we're about five years away from being empty nesters. So I'm thinking about how we could make it happen then. Hey, if you have a book idea niggling around in your brain and you're not sure how to get it out of your head, Stephanie might be a great connection for you. So if you want to know more about Stephanie, I'll have that information for you in the show notes. You just go to latebloomerliving.com forward slash podcast and click on the show notes for episode 53. And of course, while you're there, you can also find a link to the sign-up sheet for your free guide, Five Steps to Your Midlife Reboot. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a fantastic week. Stay safe and well. Talk soon.